All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, on, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM here from lovely, beautiful San Diego. As usual, it's a bright and sunny blue sky morning. Um, hope it's good wherever you are. Uh, and I'm joined today by Rachel Richards, who is in Louisville, Kentucky. How are you doing, Rachel? I'm good. Thanks, John. How are you? Excellent. And guess what? At 27 years of age, Rachel quit her job and retired. You know, I'm not going to say how old I am, but I'm not retired yet. So I'm kind of jealous and started living off passive income. So and now she's made a name for herself in the realm of personal finance. And she's been on TV shows, New York Times, all of that. And she does a lot of speaking. And one of the one of the audience that she has done a lot of speaking to is, is millennials and people coming into the workforce and that's what I thought we'd talk about today. Clearly, I'm not a millennial, obviously, um, uh, but hopefully you, can, hopefully you can teach an old dog new tricks, so maybe I'll learn something myself. But, uh, but Rachel, so as, as millennials you know, start to, they're in the workforce now and they're, and they're starting to have their first um, you know, good incomes and that coming in, what are, what are some of the challenges they face? Because I guess when, certainly when I came into the workforce, you know, the, light, the world was maybe a little bit of a simpler place and, and stuff, and now it's maybe a little bit more complicated. People come in with a lot of debt, et cetera, from maybe college. And so what are some of the issues facing millennials in the, as they enter the workforce? Yeah, for sure. It is, it is complicated um, for, for us millennials now. You know, the thing that I've realized is that we are truly in a financial education crisis as a country because at no point in our lives are we taught how to manage our money. You know, we're not being taught in high school, not being taught in college. Sometimes we're not being taught by our parents. And so we go from zero income all throughout college and never having to look at money to then suddenly making this huge paycheck and not knowing what the heck to do with it. <laughs> and that can be a bit of a reality check. Um, and it's unfortunate because a lot of the millennials that I know, they really want to get good at financial management and really control their financial future, but they don't know how. And instead, what they're feeling is feelings of guilt and shame and just all around negative feelings around money because they've never been taught and they feel that that's their fault. Um, so it's a little bit unfortunate kind of having that mindset, being brand new into the workforce and trying to navigate that all on our own. Mm -hmm. So, so why why do millennials uh, feel like shame about about this? I mean, that's an interesting for for people obviously from my generation. That's a strange thing to get your head around. Yeah, I think there's so much to be said for social media these days, yeah. and it's it's like keeping up with the Joneses, mm -hmm. except it's so much worse because social mm -hmm. media puts everything in your face. Oh, my friend just went on this trip. Why can't I afford to go on a trip? Like, man, I must not be doing as well. And it's just so much worse because it's constant. It's online and you're always on your phone. So I think we're really bad at comparing ourselves to other people and mm -hmm. making assumptions about other people's financial situations that they're a lot better off than we are, even though in reality, most people are in debt and not really doing well with their finances. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know. I think that's a perfect. I call it the uh, the comparison culture because that's exactly it. I mean, and it just and it just doesn't affect millennials. It affects everybody. Uh, you know, some people you know, wake up in the morning and the first thing they do is they check their social media and then they see like their you know, maybe their ex wife standing in front of a Ferrari and they go, "Oh my god!" Oh my god. And it turns out. <laughs> Turns out that she was just walking down the street and took a picture in front of a Ferrari. But hey, they don't know that. And so all of <laughs> this. Right. So so I, I I agree with you. So there's 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 a greater level of exposure to the world. I guess when we were coming up, you know, we could only really compare ourselves to pretty much our peer group, to be honest. Um, and now you have this whole expanded uh, expanded comparison. So what what are some of the first things that um, millennials can do to start taking control of their finances and maybe breaking through that barrier and realizing that you know maybe they need to push aside some of the comparisons and just focus on their own stuff. Yeah, for sure. There's some really easy things that everyone can do to get started. So in my first best-selling book, Money Honey, mm -hmm. I talk about something called the golden number. And this is a concept that has really resonated with, with people. So your golden number is simply how much money you have left over each month after you've spent everything you need to spend. So it's your mm -hmm. income minus your expenses. It's how much you're saving each month. And the thing is, when I teach in workshops and I say, okay, if you're trying to save money quickly, 
um, you know, for concert tickets, car repair, whatever it may be, if you're trying to save up that money real quick, what, what sorts of things do you do? And most people will say, you know, I'm going to stop going to Starbucks. I'm going to cook at home more. I'm going to shop less. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to find ways to save money. And what I realized is that there's a common theme there. We're all kind of focused on how to decrease our expenses which is great because we should always be focused on getting our spending in line. Um, So that's definitely an awesome thing to do, but it's limited. There's only so much you can decrease your expenses, right? You can't negotiate your mortgage. You can't stop paying your car insurance. So there's kind of a limit on how much you can do. And plus, I don't know about you, John, but I've tried to put myself on a really strict budget before. And then it was just sad. And it was, (laughs) you know, I was like, oh, I want to go out to eat with my friends and I can't. Or, you know, or you just break your budget and then you feel like a failure because it wasn't even realistic to begin with. (laughs) So we don't want to set ourselves up for failure like that. So what I realized is that there's two ways to increase your golden number, to increase how much you're saving. You can either decrease your expenses or you can increase your income. Mm-hmm. And the great thing about increasing your income is that there is no cap on how much money you can make. There's nothing stopping right. you from going out and making more money. So if someone really wants to make the biggest impact on their budget and on their golden number, then they'll do both. They'll decrease their expenses and they'll increase their income. Yeah. And that's an interesting because I think, uh, as you were saying earlier, because there's all these influence influences out there that I do think that going and increasing your earnings and, and setting that as a goal, you know, sometimes that's in, in the popular culture now. It seems to be looked down a little bit upon, which is, seems like a very strange place that we've arrived at. Um, so what are some of the ways that people, so somebody sitting there saying, yeah, but Rachel, I, get, I earn X amount, that's my salary. What can I do to increase that? My, my boss won't give me an increase. And yeah. So some, some easy ways to increase your income. Um, when I think about income, there's two big categories. There's mm-hmm. active or earned income, and then there's passive income. Mm-hmm. And the first thing to decide is which type of income do you want to create more of? So an example would be, okay, you could go out part-time and get a part-time job on the weekends. You could babysit, right. you could house sit, pet sit, mow lawns, any of those things. Those are all things where you're trading your time for your money. So that's active mm-hmm. income. That's mm-hmm. easy for a lot of people. That's what people want to do. Then on the other side of the equation, you have passive income. And this is the opposite. So this is money that is earned with little to no ongoing work. So this, this could be things like rental income. You know, if you own a rental property and you're generating cash flow, I earn royalties from my books um, passively. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of ways to make passive income. And the great thing about passive income is that you're not trading your time for your money. So you're making money with very little effort. So that's, those are the two big categories. And for anyone looking to create more income, the first thing is to decide which one is more exciting to me, which one's the easiest, which one could I get going the fastest. And you can do more than one thing. Mm-hmm. You could do something that's active and something that's passive. Yeah. That, that's where I would start. Yeah, and maybe you do something active in order in order to earn the money to invest in something that can be passive later. Exactly. Right? Yes. yes. And and so that so that's the point. So maybe some people would look at that and say, okay, yeah, okay, so I can work a little more, but you know, rental properties or stuff. Like, I don't know anything about that. I wouldn't even know where to start. What do you say to people like that? Oh, yeah. So the great thing about passive income is that it truly is the most attainable way to achieve financial independence. Anyone at any age on any income can create passive income. So in my newest book, it's called Passive Income Aggressive Retirement. I outline 28 different passive income models. So there's all sorts of ideas out there. I mean, there's plenty to choose from. Rental income is a big one because that's what we commonly associate with passive income. But I know that that can be intimidating or maybe people think they don't have enough money. You know, there's kind of some creative ways around that. Um, But for those that maybe don't want to do rental income or maybe don't have enough money for portfolio Mm -hmm. income... There's all these other really cool ideas. So there's this whole category of royalty income where you can, you can write a book or create an online course or, you know, musicians make royalties off their music. So things like that, that normally requires a little bit more creativity, a little bit more marketing. Um, there's also a category that I call coin operated machines. So this would be something like a vending machine or an mm. arcade game or a laundromat. Those are all ways to make passive income. And then the the last big category that I talk about in my book is ads and e-commerce. 
So people that are able to start blogs and outsource the content creation, Mm -hmm. because if you're still creating the content, it's still pretty active. But if you're able to start (laughs) something and hire a team and outsource a lot of that work, then that can be passive income. Um, And I talk about Bobby Hoyt in my book, who has done that exact thing with his website, which is the Millennial Money Man. And Mm -hmm. he generates like six figures a month now from his blog. So it's pretty crazy. Um, also drop shipping, e-commerce. Um, there's a couple other things in that category, but the point is tons of ideas that anyone yeah. can do. <laughs> yeah. And, and I guess the thing that the thing where the, where uh, the generation now have such an advantage is these things are all very, very doable. Once upon a time, they wouldn't have been at all. I mean, there would have been very few things. Yes. You could have done the rental income you could do some of those others, but, um, but the things you've described, like, you know, starting your own blog and getting it up. I mean, that's, you can do that pretty easily. Um, even, you know, e-commerce, uh, you know, and re- even writing, publishing books has, I mean, obviously got a lot easier now. So there, there's so many different opportunities that people just didn't have once upon a time. Oh yeah. The internet has made everything possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what are some of the, what are some of the big mistakes you see that uh, young people making when they, when they first have income and uh, you know, what are some of the mistakes they make and why they get themselves into a mess? Cause let's face it. The other thing that's the internet's very easy, but then there's everybody out there giving you credit cards, giving you financing, everything you buy, giving you lots and lots of ways to get yourself into serious debt. Yeah. And so that's exactly what I was going to say is credit cards. Credit cards are normally the biggest mistake that I would say not even just young people make, but anyone can make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the thing about credit cards is if you don't know how they work, then you can easily get yourself into a cycle of debt. It's very scary. I mean, they target young people because young people don't necessarily have the education and understanding of Mm -hmm. how credit cards work. And then young people end up in debt. Um, But so that can be scary. The thing with the credit card is you want to treat it like a debit card. So if you can't afford to buy something and you don't have the money in the bank right then, then you shouldn't be buying it because you can't afford it. And credit Mm -hmm. cards will trick you because they'll say, oh, well, instead of buying this $500 item that you want to buy, you know, we can split up the payments for you, make it a lot more affordable. But the thing is, it's not more affordable because you're paying a 20 to 25% interest rate. Mm -hmm. And then you'll get to the point where you'll say oh man, I don't know, I'm going to buy this thing on my credit card because I know that I have a paycheck coming in two weeks. So I know I'll be able to cover it. So then you're kind of pre-spending your paycheck. Mm -hmm. And then there comes one day where your paycheck's not enough to cover the entire balance. That's where you start going into debt. So it's super sneaky. So I always say, you know, treat your credit card like a debit card. Make sure you're paying in balance in full every single month. That's the only responsible way to use a credit card. And if you can use it responsibly and not be, you know, tempted um, by buying things that you can't afford, then I think credit cards can actually be really useful because you can earn bonus points, uh, cash back, miles. I mean, I travel for cheap or for free because of my credit cards. So Mm -hmm. it's not like they're all evil. You just have to be able to use them responsibly. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think, unfortunately, though, um, you know, there's a lot of messages, there's a lot of mixed messages people are getting, especially nowadays. I mean, you just even listen to the news now when people are talking about giving everything away for free and forgiving debts that people have run up and all of this kind of stuff. I mean, there's a lot of mixed messages. So financial discipline is actually, you're almost running contrary to all the messages you're hearing. Oh, for sure. And there's so much to be said for the fake news, you know, on the internet. And, um, you know, I see offers all the time. It's like, Mm -hmm. open a checking account and we'll give you $300. Like I get that in my mail constantly. (laughs) But if you don't read the fine print, then you don't realize, oh, well, there's an account minimum and they're going to charge you a fee and you have to do this for at least six months and you have to have a direct deposit. So there's all Mm -hmm. these little requirements. And if you don't catch all of them, then you're a, you're not going to get that 300 bucks and B you're going to be out money because you're going to end up paying them fees. <laughs> so you just, you have to kind of take everything with a grain of salt and just think to your, and I know it sounds very cynical, but you just have to think to yourself, okay, well, what's the catch here? Cause there is a catch. There's always a catch. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, you know, I grew up in Ireland originally, but when I first came to America, one of the things people used to always just say is just remember, there's no free lunches. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And That's it's right. a good lesson. And I think people should remember that. That, And especially when things when things sound too good to be true, they normally are. So Absolutely. Yeah. So what's, what's the last piece of advice you would give to uh, a young person about, you know, really getting their finances on track? 
Okay. My biggest piece of advice, I'm very passionate about investing and investing Mm -hmm. at a young age because young people have the power and the advantage of time. And a young person that has 40 years until retirement can save so much more than somebody who waits even just a few years. So there's an example I always like to share. This is really powerful. It's a scenario where we look at two people that start investing at different ages Mm -hmm. and we see the difference in the amount of money they end up with when they're 65 and they retire. So let's say someone's 35 years old when they start investing and they invest a hundred bucks a month, they get a 10% return and they invest until they're 65. The 35-year-old would end up with about $217,000 in that Mm -hmm. scenario. So, you know, that's a decent chunk of money, right? I mean, I'd take it. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's probably not going to last them through a 30-year retirement. Okay, so let's say that you're a 25-year-old and you start investing and you do everything else the same. You invest 100 bucks a month, you get a 10% return, and you invest until you're 65. You would end up with almost $600,000. So that is more than double what the Mm -hmm. other person had. And it's all because you started at a young age. So think about this. Even if you're not the best investor and you don't have the most amount of money, you will still be better off than an expert investor who waits 10 years to start Mm -hmm. investing because you have the advantage of time. So that's Mm -hmm. my biggest lesson. Get started now. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second (laughs) best time is today. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. The best time to start anything is now. Put one foot in front of the other and just start moving. Here, an interesting thing is um, the Generation Z, uh, my son's like 15 and he and his friends, you know, they play all these online video games together, but they invest. They buy like virtual things. They like buy virtual knives and then they put them out onto the market and they increase. In fact, it's crazy. Like, oh my I, gosh, I that's so interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're they're like learning about all this because you say, oh yeah, I bought a $30 virtual knife and I put it on the market. It's now worth $60. And I'm, how is it even possible? But anyway. Wow, that's pretty cool. Good for him. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, listen, Rachel, this has been fantastic. Uh, all of Rachel's information will be in her contributor bio, links to her books and her website. Website. But before we go, Rachel, just tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, so I'm a lot of things. Um, I'm a real <laughs> estate investor. I own over 35 rental units. I'm the best selling author of two books on financial literacy, Money Honey, and Passive Income Aggressive Retirement. I'm a former financial advisor. And um, what people find most interesting about me, you already touched on, is that last year at age 27, I quit my job and retired, and I have over $10,000 per month in passive income. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, I, I won't pretend I'm jealous. So, we'll just, we'll <laughs> skip on with that. but that's great, and uh, and looking forward uh, to maybe talking to you again and coming back and, and expanding on some of these, Rachel. This has been fantastic. I know our viewers uh, and listeners will really appreciate it because uh, you know we have a lot of millennials tuning in now. We're also um, sales pop is used in some of the universities, particularly DePaul University uses it for its its sales class. So this will be very interesting to to those young people. So thank you for today. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Have a good one. You too. All right. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Mm-hmm.